Hey, everybody, and welcome to episode 81 of Growing in God. I want to thank you so much for joining me today. Um, if you've been following along, we have just finished up our attributes of God, and so we have something new today. We're going to be going over the book of Ephesians, uh, actually for several reasons, which I'm going to get to in just a minute. So let me go ahead and get um, our, what we want to look at up on the screen so you don't have to look at me. And then we will go ahead and go to the Lord in prayer. So we have a lot to talk about today. We'll do a lot of groundwork, um, just like we do anytime we start a, a new section or a new book. Uh, we want to understand um, its purpose, what it's for, and kind of how it works, and how we should view um, this particular portion of Scripture. And so again, we have a lot to say, but let's go ahead and go to the Lord in prayer first, as always, um, and then, then we'll get down to business. So if you join me in prayer, I would really appreciate it. Um, Lord, we just come to you in the beautiful and wonderful name of Jesus Christ. Um, Lord, and that's, that's what this book is really about, Lord. So we're going to be starting the book of Ephesians. Um, yes, it's about our identity, Lord, but it's ultimately about you. And so, Father, I pray that you would help us to have a, a right biblical view of you as we studied in your attributes, and then a right view of ourselves, Lord, um, apart from you, and then just as importantly, um, of a healthy biblical view of ourselves once we have been brought into the family of God by the blood of Jesus. And so, Lord, uh, things are still strange um, out in the world, um, a lot of different changes, a lot of different uh, areas of uncertainty, Lord, um, but you are the one area that is always certain for us, Lord. You are immutable, you are unchangeable. And so, Lord, I just pray you would help us to focus on you. Lord, there's a, there's a lot going through our minds and our hearts and I just pray that you would help us to supernaturally set that aside so we can really focus on you. Um, help us to recall the things that we have learned throughout the various studies, um, but also have an open heart and an open mind uh, for the new things that we're going to talk about today, Lord. And God, we just pray that uh, we would use this time to grow close to you, to honor you and glorify you, Lord, and that you would change us from the inside out. Uh, Father, we just thank you so much for all the things you do. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, so uh, like I said earlier, we're moving from, uh, we finished up our attributes um, study. So there's a playlist of that on YouTube. So I'm um, not always, over necessarily overtly promoting uh, viewership and membership, um, but if you want to subscribe to the church channel, that's cool. Then you know uh, when, when things are new and then you can consistently watch those. Um, so I never want to discourage you from watching a video but I am gonna discourage you from watching this video if you haven't seen at least uh, the review session of the attributes. And you're gonna see as we talk about our major themes, as we talk about, um, you know, as we go through the scriptures and we, we kind of relate and, and put everything together, um, there, there, is, there is a need to really understand who God is before we can understand who we are. So um, again, that, that's gonna become more and more evident as we, as we continue to work through these scriptures. Um, but we're moving from um, that topical style of study where we looked at, an, looked at a concept and then took scriptures from all across the Bible uh, to support that in the attributes of God. Um, I know a lot of people generally prefer this um, straightforward or a narrative style where we're just going verse by verse. Uh, both are really, really important. And so while you may prefer one over the other, um, it's important that you understand what both of them are and how to use both of them appropriately. So we're going to go back to a narrative style. Um, as we go through the book of Ephesians, and again, I'm going to be reading uh, from the NIV version. Um, so your, your translation may have slightly different order of words or wording, um, but it'll still have the same meaning. So um, as always, what we want to do before we start reading is we want to understand some general background, um, kind of what's going on, uh, where this happens in the Bible, what, what's going on um, in Paul's life, because Paul is writing this epistle or this letter to the church in Ephesus. And so that's why it's called Ephesians. Um, they, they are um, any, anytime you see these New Testament epistles, um, it's always written to a people from an area. So just like um, here at Northside, we're in San Antonio. So we're San Antonians. Um, he's writing to the church in Ephesus. So they are Ephesians, right? So um, when, when we look at what's going on in this, uh, this is where, where Paul is writing a letter uh, to the church in Ephesus. And this has a very different tone, a very different um, air about it than some of the other letters. Um, Ephesians is primarily uh, very positive, very encouraging, uh, very focused on, on doing what's right and actually continuing to do what's right um, rather than a punitive or a corrective form. Um, so if you take Ephesians and you look at 1st and 2nd Corinthians, totally different tones uh, because Paul is, is being very um, punitive. He's being very forceful in, in a good way um, and saying like, hey, you guys are really messing this up in Corinth. 
Whereas in Ephesus, yeah, they don't have it perfect, but generally they're doing pretty darn well. Um, Paul can also uh, know that they're doing well and can and write this, this letter of intimacy to them. Um, he spent about three years there when he started the church in Ephesus, uh, but at the time of writing, uh, this is one of the prison epistles. So Paul is, is imprisoned um, and waiting to go through the whole trial and procedure and everything. And so he's writing this, this letter to the church in Ephesus um, to address some of the areas, not because they're bad, but to encourage them to continue to, to be doing well. Um, so when we, when we talk about major themes um, throughout the, the book of Ephesians, really what most people automatically go to, um, if you've been around church for any length of time, uh, you know that the armor of God is in chapter six of Ephesians. That's great. That's powerful. That, that's really um, a focal point. There's a reason that that's kind of what um, the book is known for. You, you look at all the books throughout the Bible, and they're usually known for like one or two or three like, like big things. Um, so if you've been watching on Wednesdays, um, when we went over the first part of Exodus, you think about the plagues, you think about parting of the Red Sea and, and being delivered from, from the slavery in Egypt. And those definitely are highlights, but there's a lot of other stuff that happens. And so Ephesians is, is no exception to that. So the armor of God is fantastic, um, but that comes at the, literally at the very end of the book. And, and there's a reason for that, because we need to set up all these other things and kind of focus on what we're, what we're looking at for today. So um, what, what our goal for our time is today is to talk about these themes, relate them to other stuff that we've already talked about, um, relate them to how we live our lives today. And then um, we'll start and just read just a handful of verses um, actually in chapter one. So today's a little bit more of laying some groundwork. And I know um, that may not be like super exciting for a lot of people, but understanding uh, the, the scope and understanding the, the meaning and the purpose behind what you're reading um, is really important because if you miss that, sometimes you can misread individual scriptures. And that's what we don't want as Christians. We don't want to take a scripture out of context try to make it say something it's really not saying and, and build a lifestyle or build a, a style of living um, on something that that's not even really how God intended it. So um, again, Ephesians is, is really great because it's talking about um, encouragement. It's talking about helping us to have perseverance, to, to keep fighting the good faith and, and, and doing what's right and, and just living our lives that, to honor and glorify him. So um, second to the armor of God, the next thing that Ephesians is most noted for um, is our identity in Christ, um, who we are um, and what Christ has done in us. And so what I, what I really want to focus on here, I put in parentheses because of him, capital H for God, right? And, and everything that we have, and you're going to see this right off the bat in chapter one, all of these wonderful things that we now get to enjoy because we've submitted our life to God, that we, we've humbled ourselves, we realize that we're sinners, and that Jesus is the only way to be saved, and to be reconciled to God, to have eternal life. When we do that, um, you automatically get all these wonderful blessings, and all these things change in our lives. Um, we, have, we have new potentials and new abilities, uh, but again, one of, one of the things that we can do as Christians is we can really be selfish um, with our lifestyle, and we can be really selfish even in our, in our Bible reading. Um, we, we talked about this on Wednesday, too, when, when Pastor and I were going over Exodus, that we can read the Word of God and just look at, like, okay, well, how does this help me? How does this bless me? Uh, what, what's in it for me? What can I get out of this? And, and don't get me wrong, that's definitely a thing, right? There, there is a benefit to following the Lord. Um, you, you just kind of take a step back and think, well, if, if I have to do all these things and there's no upside or there's no benefit, well, then I don't want to do it. Um, you may look at that whether you're, um, you know, thinking about changing jobs, or maybe you're going to buy a vehicle or make a big purchase or decide what you're going to do uh, on your day off or whatever. And you always kind of say like, is it worth it? Is it, is there an upside to doing what I'm doing? And so in Christianity, there's definitely an upside that, that God does all these wonderful things. And a lot of those things are highlighted here in Ephesians. And so there, there definitely is that, and there's an enjoyment and there's a satisfaction and there's a peace and a joy that we get because of our relationship with God. But we can never miss the fact that everything that we have is because of him. Uh, chapter one is going to say some really powerful foundational things, and it will become very clear very quickly that it's because of him. So when I discouraged you from watching this video before you watch the attributes of God, if, if we don't have a good, healthy picture on who God is, then we can misinterpret and misuse even these very encouraging scriptures that are found in Ephesians. Um, it's, it's not about us. It's about him. 
Do we get to enjoy it? Absolutely. Is it better with him than without him? Absolutely. Uh, but it's still about him. And so when we have that focus, when we have a, a right view of God and a right view of us and right relationship um, in, in scope and right relationship in, um, in relationship, um, that helps everything else go straight. Uh, we use the illustration lots of times. Um, if you're wearing a button up shirt, you know, if, if you kind of start in the middle and you might like have them misaligned, if you get that first button wrong, um, all the other buttons will not be lined up appropriately. And it's normally like when you're done buttoning up your shirt, you're like, oh, I messed up the buttons because one side is way higher than the other one. Uh, but if we start at that, at that, at that top button, um, and if you're wearing a tie, you usually start at the very top, otherwise you start at the second one, right? And if you get that right, then everything else lines up below it. And so that's kind of the same idea that I want us to look at the book of Ephesians, because if we have a right view of God, who he is, his attributes, his nature, his character, and we get, we get that button right, then everything else lines up. Um, when, when we have an incorrect view of who God is, and those buttons are mismatched, as it were, um, that's when people can start to take scripture out of context, um, start to assume things that are not true or use them in ways um, to just benefit themselves, even at the disadvantage or of taking advantage of other people. And we definitely don't want to do that. So uh, we're going to be focusing on our identity. Um, and, and again, we're, we're belaboring all these major themes on purpose because we want to have a, a good view of what we're doing in this as we read this letter that Paul wrote to the church in Ephesus. So again, our identity in Christ is really important because if you just listen to whether it's a political leader, um, a social leader, uh, somebody who's popular in the media, um, everybody is, has kind of had their, everybody apart from Christ, right? It, it kind of has their own spin about how they think things work or why things happen or how things happen. And so um, there's a lot of misinformation out there, especially for Christians, right? Even unfortunately within some church buildings, um, there are some, some pastors and some teachers who stand in front of a congregation and say things that are just not biblical. Um, yes, it's a, a verse of scripture, but again, how that's used, it's used out of context to make this uh, subsection of theology that, that's just not true. And so we need to understand truthfully from God um, who we are in him, what our identity is in Christ. But again, it's because of what he has done. So the way that this, um, this is kind of set up is um, Ephesians is only six chapters long. Uh, but I will tell you that we're going to go pretty slowly through this because there are some extremely powerful things that we really need to not only read and understand mentally, but also understand in our heart. And so there'll be lots of times throughout this study where we're going to, you know, we might only read a handful of verses and have a lot of practical discussion about, well, what does that mean? What does that look like? How can I use that uh, when, when I close my, my app on my phone or when I shut down my laptop and I, I go to work or I see my family? How can I use that and do that? Um, that's what I, I really want this to be very practical uh, because it's talking about who we are. So when we look at a general breakdown um, of those six chapters, uh, the first three chapters are really focusing on our unity in Christ, that we have all been brought together uh, because of who he is and what he has done for us, paying the penalty for our sins so that we can be reconciled to God. And so if half of the book is focused on that, you know it's a big deal. And so really understanding uh, what has been done for us when we were saved, uh, what that looks like and how that plays out um, is really important conceptually, like in, in like a big picture kind of mentality. And then what we see in the, the second half of the book is first three chapters are our relationship to God and then our relationship um, with each other in our household, in our local church, and like just with the world at large. Um, and you see the same general format uh, when there's the Ten Commandments, the first four are our relationship to God, and then the bottom six are our relationship to people. And so it, it kind of mimics that same pattern of loving God and knowing God, uh, but we don't want to live in a bubble with just us and God. We have other people that you see. We live in this world with other people, um, and we want to know how to live a right and Christian, a uh, godly life. And man, chapters you know four and five especially um, are so applicable to today when uh, people are calling good things evil and evil things good. Um, God is going to be really clear and direct through Paul to the church in Ephesus about how a Christian man or woman should carry themselves, how they should treat other people, how they should react to certain things. And so I think you're going to find a lot of, of really encouraging um, practicality um, in those verses. And again, it's going to end up with the armor of God, how to protect ourselves while we live in a world that obviously is not uh, generally Christian, right? 
And so we kind of look at some of the, the other sub themes that come up. Um, we talk about God's purpose. Um, why is God doing what he's doing? And, and again, that, that makes that shift from, hey, it's all about me. What can I get out of it to, hey, what is God doing in this situation? And so you, you've probably found yourself um, several times recently, uh, maybe, maybe dealing with something when you're like, Man, I don't want to do this, or this wasn't my first pick. Um, but God has a plan and a purpose that is always going to prevail over ours. Uh, we learn that from his sovereignty and um, in the attributes of God. Um, and then kind of going along with that, but a little different language uh, that Christ is the center. And so if, if we're putting anything else at the center of our lives, um, our, our buttons are going to be off. And so we need to make sure that not only are we acknowledging God, um, they're even respecting God, but he really needs to be the center. Um, you know, we, we would love to say as Christians that God is number one in our lives. And those words may come out of our mouth, um, but if we're not living rightly, it's, it's like we're saying one thing, but then doing something different. So we want to have him at the center of our life. And then um, there's going to be uh, quite a bit talking about the living church, how God has reconciled all of these different people from uh, different ethnic backgrounds, of different color, of different culture, um, of different upbringing, of different positions in life, and brings them all together under the headship of Christ. And so, you know, we, we talk at length that a church is not a building, a church or all the members that God has brought, into, has brought together. Um, and he talks about that in, in, in actually both the letters to Corinth, but um, is really focusing on that, that we're all doing this together, that we all have the same goal, um, and that's to know him and love him and glorify him. And so we're not just coming together under a, a business contract. Um, that's, that's part of the new family of God. Um, you know, when the Bible says that he has given us the right to be called sons and daughters of the most high, that, that God has brought us into his family. And so I know that there's um, maybe a lot of you watching this um, and maybe you don't have the best relationship with your biological family. And you may actually feel like people at your local church um, feel more like family um, than people that you share a bloodline with. Um, and that's because the, the tie of what Jesus has done for us is stronger than, than blood or tradition or heritage or any of those things. And so we're brought into this new family that because it's new, uh, we need to know how we're supposed to live and have unity within the body of Christ, within the church. Um, and like I mentioned earlier, uh, we're going to spend a lot um, in chapters four and five talking about just Christian conduct, like how, how we should live, like what's okay and what's not okay and what, what's the goal and what's the purpose. Um, and, and God does that um, if, you're, if you're by yourself, if you're single, um, if you're married, um, if you have kids, whether you're married or not. Um, and then we're, we're going to see that this Christian conduct is going to extend not just within your house, um, but again, also in your workplace, um, as we're, we're gathering together at church, either um, you know, physically or even digitally, like how you interact with people online. Um, it's not going to talk about you know, Facebook etiquette necessarily, but if you follow this Christian conduct, um, you, everything else will fall in line. Remember, those buttons will be lined up. And then, of course, we're going to talk about the armor of God. Uh, we're not going to undermine that at all. But again, I think when, when we get this right, and then we kind of flesh that out in the first couple of chapters, and then we say, okay, now that we have this right, how do we deal with other people, uh, whether you find yourself to be uh, naturally similar to them, or you may be very different uh, from someone who's sitting in the same church pew as you, and that's okay, um, because that's the, the power and beauty of God bringing everyone together into his family, um, to look at his purpose, where Christ is the center, um, that, that we're in this active living church that we should be growing and maturing and learning and doing and sharing and not just sitting and not doing anything. Um, and that new family that we have, as we interact with all those things, um, remember there, there is a right and a wrong. There, there's a goodness that God has. There's a righteousness that God has. And so there, there are things that are expected of us because we are saved, not to be saved, uh, not to maintain our salvation, but because we are saved, there is an expectation um, for how, how we're supposed to live. Uh, parents, I think you can most readily see that, um, especially if you have like middle school um, or maybe even really high school, anybody, uh, a child, anybody who's, who's not an adult chronologically, if someone lives in your house, like you have a certain standard uh, for them and they may say, oh, my friends do this and whatever. And, and your general response as a parent should be like, oh, that's nice. But in this house, we do things this way. Uh, we always uh, use the, the illustration that your, your behavior is uh, dictated by your address, right? So if you live in your parents' house, you have to follow your parents' rules. Um, and again, not, not in a negative way, but they feel that that's what's best for you. 
And so when we look at that on a spiritual level, that we're in the family of God, that we're under his headship, uh, there, there's a certain expectation for us and how we're supposed to live, um, just, just how we carry ourselves and how we interact with people um, in and around us, even at work, even when you're standing in line at HEB, um, and be able to, to deal with that, we need the armor of God. So um, we spent a, a good portion of time uh, talking about that, and I, I hope that that's helpful to you to kind of have a uh, a lens or a scope or kind of a general idea of, of what we're looking at. And so what we're going to do is we're going to start reading um, in chapter one, and um, we'll just see how far we get. Again, there, there's some really rich, beautiful verses here. And so we never want to just read something that's awesome and has huge impact for our life and just like casually go over it. Um, again, this, this is going to be a little different than, you know, the Read Scripture app or other things where you're trying to be able to cover a large portion of scripture. That's really important because you need to know what's in there. Um, but there are definitely some times that we really need to slow down and just like soak up all the goodness that's in some of these verses. So with that being said, um, let's actually get to some verses. So we're going to start here in chapter one. And again, this is the, the newer iteration of the NIV. So you may have slightly different words, um, or if you're reading like ESV, you may have two things transposed or swapped within the same, um, within the same verse, but you're going to see it's going to say the same thing, right? So here we go in Ephesians chapter one with verse one, and we'll just see how far we get. Uh, it says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God to God's holy people in Ephesus, the faithful in Christ Jesus. So again, we know it's Paul. Uh, we know Paul is doing this because it's God's will. Um, if, you, if you look at the conversion experience of Paul, he was definitely not living for the Lord. So the fact that he's doing like almost literally the opposite of what he was doing uh, before he got saved you know that, that God has gotten a hold of him and what he's doing is by the will of God. And I hope that we could all say that for our lives, that if you look at yourself before you got saved, uh, you were on a certain track and you should hopefully be on a very different track now that you've accepted him as Lord and Savior. And so everything that we do should be governed by his will. It's not like you get saved and you're like, cool, I'm saved. Now I can just go do whatever I want to do. It's actually very much the opposite, that we were just doing whatever we wanted to do, um, and that was ending in, in sin and heartache and death and destruction and pain and regret and guilt and all these terrible things. And then when we're saved by God, we're saved to serve um, is, is a common verse that you're going to, is, is a common saying that you're going to hear within the church. And a lot of those verses, um, the foundation for that saying is actually going to come in chapter two, um, that God has created us um, to do things in accordance with his will. So even just before we even get through the first full verse, um, what we do and how we live our lives should be lining up with the will of God. And so to God's holy people in Ephesus, right? We talked about that. Uh, the faithful in Christ Jesus, remember they're, they're generally doing what's right. And so this is gonna be an encouragement letter instead of a, hey, what's wrong with you guys? What are y'all doing? Uh, we go into verse two of chapter one, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And so really having, having that focus, it's not just a quick throwaway like, oh, hey, uh, yeah, I pray everything's going great for you. Um, no, he's understanding that, that the grace, remember attributes not getting, uh, getting what we don't deserve, right? And peace is not just the absence of conflict, but peace is being okay even in the midst of conflict. Um, Paul's praying that for them, right, from God. And so we see even the peace that you and I have um, amidst all oh, the world is crazy. You know, the world's just crazy in general and things politically and with the pandemic. And it's just, nobody knows what's going to happen next. And so um, we always need the peace of God, but this is especially a time where we really need the peace of God. And that's something that you and I can't manufacture on our own. That has to come from him. So again, th these are greeting verses, um, but these are not just like throw away, like, oh, hey, what's up? How are you guys doing? Um, Paul is really praying, hey, even though you're doing well, you still need grace and peace from God. Um, so if, if you've been um, let me say this this way. If you've been in a relationship with God for a while and you're, you're doing well, like you're maturing and you're growing, that's great. Um, but there's always this trap or this temptation to think I'm doing all these steps correctly. I'm creating all these things. And the enemy would love to come in and say like, oh, hey, you're, you're doing a great job. Keep it up, Jeff. You're, you're doing so awesome. When in actuality, I'm just, you and I are just humbling ourselves to God and God is actually working mightily through us. And so that grace and that peace and the, the things that we're enjoying, if, if your relationship with God is going well right now, that's still from him. Like, yeah, you're taking some practical steps. And that's really in, in chapters four and five of this book. That's great. But he's still the one who's doing it. Right. And so we don't we don't want to miss uh, what God is doing. Uh, verse three, praise be to the God and father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms 
with every spiritual blessing in Christ. And so again, just looking at that and, and when, when things go well, we should be praising God, like, thank you, Jesus, you know, and even whether it's something big or something little, when, when things go well, you bring praise to God. Even when things are maybe not going the way that you wanted them to, if you're doing what's right, we should be praising God for that. And we read a verse in, in attributes that, that was talking about, you know, it's, if it's God's will, it's better for you to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. So even when things may not be perfect around you, if you're doing what's right by God, you can still praise him. You know, you should be able to praise him in every single situation. Um, and getting to the second half of this verse, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. And we're going to see that, that that's really twofold. Um, you know, the, the first and probably the easiest one to see is that if, if we, um, we were all separated from God, and it's going to get into that in chapter two here on um, the next couple of episodes, we've been brought into the family of God. We've been bought by the blood of Jesus. His righteousness have been imputed or given to us. And so now we have right standing with God. We've been brought into his family. And so we've been blessed in the heavenly realms, you know, not, not necessarily what we can see and touch and feel, uh, but in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing that we've gone from death to life, you know, that we've been made a new creation in Christ. And that one day, um, wh whether you, you know, close your eyes and don't open them again, or if you're still here when Christ comes a second time, whichever one happens first, we're going to be with him eternally. And so that's amazing. And even when you have the worst day of your entire life, you can say, you know what? At least I'm going to be with God in heaven forever, where everything's going to be perfect. And all this junk that's just a, a mist, it's a temporal thing, that's going to go away and I'm going to be with him forever. And so just that alone should encourage you. So that's really one of the, the biggest ways that we look and interpret that. Um, but another way that we're going to focus on as we talk about living a Christian life in an unchristian world is he's blessing us in every in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. Um, that's talking about being with him eternally, but it's also talking about like us today here right now. And so we need to understand that we have every spiritual blessing in Christ, that everything that you and I need to navigate this fallen world has been given to us. And even though that seems like you might say, yeah, okay, I agree. That seems pretty simple. No big deal. That everything that we need to live a Christian life has been given to us because of who Christ is. And so what that's going to do is dispel or reject anytime you face a situation and you're like, ah, oh, man, it's too hard. I can't deal with this. It's too stressful. Um, it's too much for me. I'll just, I'll either give into the temptation or I'll just ignore everything and kind of like shut down. Um, that is actually a lie from the enemy that we have, we have everything that we need to face every single situation, especially if we're living in his will, especially if we're doing what's right. Even when you face a difficult time, God is going to give you every spiritual blessing to be able to supernaturally deal with that situation. And so I don't know if you're facing something really hard today, um, an individual thing, or like something that gets me down. Like if it's one big thing, I'm usually okay. Uh, but when it's a whole bunch of small to mid-sized problems, like that's what kind of wears me down personally. And I have to remind myself and you have to remind yourself that you and I have every spiritual blessing we need to be able to confront that one big problem or all those little problems and do what's right by God, that we are going to be supernaturally empowered. And we're going to see that in chapter two, to be able to do what's right, no matter what's going on around us, because from the heavenly realms, we have every single spiritual blessing that we need in Christ. And so we're just about out of time for today. And I know we just went through three verses, um, but I hope that you're already seeing um, the, the, the usefulness um, the practicality of this, that even just from getting our grace and peace from him and understanding that you have everything that you need to do what God has called you to do. He's never going to call you to something without equipping you to do that thing. Um, even if it doesn't feel like it, God is going to give you um, the, the wisdom. God is going to give you the strength. God is going to give you the endurance to be able to deal with those situations because he's given us every spiritual blessing in Christ. Amen. So on that note, we'll go ahead and pray. And then we'll close out and then we'll pick up with verse four uh, for next week. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Uh, Father, we thank you so much just for you, Lord. Um, as we talked about at length today, as we went over the, the overview of the book of Ephesians, Father, help us never to forget that it's about you. Yes, there's things that we enjoy and, and when we get benefits from what you have done, Lord, just like we just read, um, that we have every spiritual blessing, Lord, to be able to deal with any situation, uh, to be able to navigate this, this world that is not... Uh, lifting up your name and living for you. God, you've given us every single thing 
that we need, Lord. But again, you have given it to us. And as we continue to read chapter one next time, we're going to see how, how critical it is to have you at the center of our life, uh, to not just say it, but to live it out, Lord. So, Father, I pray that you would just purpose in our minds and our hearts right now um, that we would be really be focused on you. And again, not just say it, but really trust in you and live out our reliance on you, Lord, because without you, uh, we, are, we are lost and miserable and desperate, Lord. And so, Father, I thank you for sending your only son to die on the cross for us so that we could be made right with you. And Father, as we continue to, to read in this book, Lord, I pray that you would open up the eyes of our heart, Lord, open up our understanding and our brains to see truly um, who we are in you because of what you have done for us. So Father, we thank you and we love you, Lord. You're awesome. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, everybody. Great work. Got some groundwork. So next time we can just hit the ground running and um, hit some more verses. So I thank you for joining me today and I will see you next episode.